love seeing wildlife and I, I really hope to share that with visitors who come in the center as well as visitors who come around to Dubois that want to see wildlife and hope that I can share that with them. Hi hey everybody, I'm Bernie Rose. I've been with the Sheep Center since the summer of 2016. Uh, born and raised in South Jersey, where they don't have big horn sheep. So working here and being the visitors has been an awesome, awesome opportunity for me. I love it here. I love learning about the big horn sheep. And nice to meet everybody that I've not met in person, again, virtually. Thanks. Thanks, Steph. Uh, taking us to the next slide. So new director here. Phenomenal staff, what are our key priorities that we'll seek to implement in all of our programming? And the first is flexing with the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic has caused us to face capacity limits. We've seen reduced numbers of group, group and educational tours into our center. We're seeing this as an opportunity to reinvent ourselves in the virtual space and to increase our presence in the outdoors. Um, so, as you may have seen, we've increased outdoor programming this winter and we look to do so in the spring and continue that as long as the time requires. Second priority, increasing organizational capacity. And what do I mean by that? I mean, it's a priority of mine to provide staff with the resources and tools so that they can do their job the best they possibly can. It's very important for me to have technology that works, but be equally trained in it. Additionally, it's important to have a staff that communicates very well um, and collaborates, and we use our technology to allow us to do so. A third priority of mine is to expand our partnerships. Previous leadership has done a stellar job at this, and I will continue. I'd like to expand in both the educational and conservation realms, looking at uh, looking at our expansion from a county down level, hoping to reach every county in Wyoming in a short amount of time. I'd like to look at partnerships that we have with organizations that already have a national footprint, such as the Boys and Girls Club. We can use those organizations as a, as a source to disseminate our programming. Karen, we've got work cut out for you. <laughs> we'll do it together. Um, priority number four is to continue our legacy. First and foremost, that means continuing to create lifelong impressions on youth through our educational programs such as Camp Bighorn. Secondly, it means I want to create a deeper relationship with you. So if you have ideas, if you have questions, give me a call, send me an email, or walk on these doors. We'd love all of staff will welcome you and love to hear from you. Thirdly, I want rejuvenating our capital campaign. We have, we're offering an opportunity for classroom naming, and fourth, increase our focus on contributions to our endowment funds. Taking us now to the agenda, so where we'll speak about um, more, where we'll, where we'll go today. Um, first, we have Mr. Daryl Lutz joining us. Um, we have already seen that he can share his screen, yay. Um, Daryl is the Wyoming Game and Fish Wildlife Management Coordinator. Today, he'll be giving us a brief herd update. So I'll pause here. Um, Daryl, I'll give you the green chair. I'll give you the host permission once more, and feel free to take it over. I'm working on it here. <laughs> flexing with COVID, flexing with technology. <laughs> Yeah, flexing with the, the old guy with technology. Can everybody see that? Yeah. Yep. Good, good. Yeah, so my name is Daryl Lutz. As, as Sarah said, I am the wildlife management coordinator in the Laramie region and have the privilege of over seeing the people that actually manage wildlife in this region, which includes the Whiskey Mountain Bighorn Sheep Herd Unit. And of course, we all know how important this herd has been historically continues to be and, and certainly are facing a lot of challenges with this herd. So I'll give you a brief overview where we're at today um, and, and at least some of the things that uh, we've tried and will continue to implement as part of the plan. 
But before I start, I just want to acknowledge the Bighorn Sheep Center and all of you folks that volunteer your time and of course also that work there and, and serve as an educational um, branch of, of really our agency and the Wild Sheep Foundation as well. The work that you do is is unparalleled and it's incredibly important and so the department certainly values the partnership and the relationships that we've built so thank you for that sarah welcome aboard um you're in a cool place and have a lot of opportunity to do a lot of good for these critters these bighorn sheep that that all of us are so passionate about so with that i'll i'll go through this um i guess so it's up to you, but if folks have questions, I don't care if you interrupt me or, or whatever works best. So why is this herd so important? And, and many of you probably know that the this whiskey herd was recognized for not just years, but literally decades as the largest congregation of bighorn sheep in the country. And of course, we don't we don't have the privilege of saying that anymore for for a lot of reasons, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, in its heyday, really, in, from about the late 40s um, through near the end of the last century, about 1,900 bighorn sheep were captured and translocated from this herd unit, this herd unit alone, and, and transplanted or translocated throughout the state and really throughout the Western United States in many locations. It was considered one of the primary source herds for trying to reestablish bighorn sheep populations around the West. And of course, this herd through time has provided exceptional opportunity for outdoor enthusiasts, recreationists, hunters, photographers, and others. And then I just want to bring up that there's actually a technical committee that oversees much of the management of this herd unit. And that's called the Whiskey Mountain Bighorn Sheep Technical Committee. And this committee has been, been in, in, in play. It's been in existence since 1968. So, gosh, what is that? Near 50 years now. And um, it has even received national awards for much of the work that it has done, primarily preserving habitat, critical habitats for this sheep herd. And I don't have to tell you all, especially those of you that live in Dubois, that the whiskey herd is part of the identity or fabric of your community. Well, a little bit about the population for those of you that aren't that familiar with this herd. A um, little bit of history going back to the middle of the last century, it was estimated there were about 500 bighorn sheep in all of the Wind River mountain range not just this herd unit, but literally from South Pass on um, to Dubois in the Wind Rivers. The whiskey herd itself, um, we estimated was at about 2,000 in animals in the late 1980s. And as you all know, it, it experienced an all age die off caused by pneumonia in the winter of 1990 and 91. And sadly, um, gosh, for a, a lot of reasons, and we're going to hear from Brittany and Rachel in, in a few minutes, but we estimate that there's probably less than 500 bighorn sheep in this herd as we speak. And of course, we think that lamb recruitment underpins that population decline, and, and much of that, that decline or the decreased lamb survival is due to, due to ongoing and chronic pneumonia. Um, you know, it's interesting that this herd, and, and this isn't really common in ungulate species, but it, bighorn sheep maintain body condition really well throughout the winter months, but boy, they really, really suffer in this herd unit and actually de decrease in body condition during the summer. And that's, a, that's something that we just don't see very often. So that's a particular interest to to us as managers and to the researchers that are working to try to answer why that's the case. Um, and as you all probably know, again, lamb ratios, that's when we go out, or I should say Greg Anderson, the wildlife biologist for this area, flies this herd unit, counts all the sheep he sees, and, and calculates a lamb ratio from those counts. 
that lamb, those lamb ratios started declining most recently in 2015 and were the lowest ever observed in this herd unit in 2017, as you can see in this graph. The green bars are the herd unit as a whole. The herd units comprised of hunt areas eight, which is on the Pinedale side on the other side of the Continental Divide. And then of course, hunt areas nine on the Dubois side. And you can see that the herd unit, as I said, started a sharp decline um, in 2015. And gosh, look at that low bar in 2017. And if I remember right, that was, well, I can tell you what it was. It was eight, eight lambs for every 100 ewes. That's dismally low. Look at that brown line. That's the, that's Hunt Area 8. That's the Pinedale side. And that's a, that's a unique subpopulation in this herd. It has, it, it exhibits different behaviors. And boy, they, they have really done well the past few years. And that's interesting because the Dubois subpopulations of this herd do mingle with that Pinedale group of sheep. And so we know that those Pinedale sheep are exposed to the bacteria, or likely exposed to the bacteria that cause pneumonia, but apparently they have some different immunity or ability to overcome it that, that the population, subpopulations on the Dubois side just don't have. And then of course that red line is Hunt Area 9. It's done a little bit better over the past few years, but you can see that general popular or lamb recruitment decline. And then of course Hunt Area 10, which is Whiskey Mountain itself, has really suffered. So as you would expect when Greg's in the helicopter and he counts sheep from year to year, you would expect to see this declining um, in, in the number, this decline in the number of sheep that he sees. And, and I don't need to tell you, you can see it, but that's a pretty sharp decline. I guess one positive note is that, you know, certainly our winter ranges, the work that the country that the Technical, technical committee has worked so hard to maintain and, and to improve for this herd unit. That forage production on those winter ranges is quite good, um, especially since, well, about 2015. So for the last five years, it's been extraordinarily good. Of course, in 2020, we experienced a pretty dry summer and grass production is certainly reflected in, in what we saw for moisture. So winter ranges, again, are not a concern forage production on them is is has is quite good and we don't we don't see that changing we also measure in the in the spring of the year um, how much of that grass that we measure actually gets eaten by by sheep and and elk and, and other critters and and that red line we just don't want to see utilization get above that red line and as you can see in most years since Oh, what about 2004 or five? We've been in pretty good shape and with regard to utilization. And of course, with the decline in bighorn sheep on these winter ranges, the past several years, that's what you would expect. So again, um, our winter ranges are in good shape. Over the past uh, about nine years, the department has been engaged in statewide disease surveillance and bighorn sheep. We've done, I think, and Kevin Hurley can, can correct me if I'm wrong, but we probably have one of the best disease monitoring data sets in bighorn sheep anywhere in their range. And that's because of all the testing that we've been able to accomplish over the past, oh, about 10 years. And those pie charts in that, <clears throat> in that map that you see, don't, don't get hung up on how big each piece of pie is. Um, because it doesn't matter the size, it's just whether or not which bugs are present and those, those colors represent different bacteria that are thought or known to cause um, pneumonia. And our disease pathologist, who is probably one of the most knowledgeable in the country, um, calls, it refers to the evil triad, and the evil triad are those three bacteria that you see listed there, Pasturella multocida, Mycoplasma ova pneumoniae, or what many people oftentimes refer to as MOBI, and Mannheimia hemolytica. And so it's been, it's been demonstrated that 
in bighorn sheep populations when they are exposed when in particular when they're exposed to those three bacteria um, you're likely going to see a, a dramatic increase in the prevalence of of clinical pneumonia and probably some degree of die-off and it's also been shown that when when sheep are in poor body condition both in summer and winter um, and that and i guess that's gosh that's pretty um intuitive their sheep are pretty pretty much predisposed to um pneumonia especially when that triad is present in that population so you can see in that whiskey herd unit there's a lot of colors there and frankly um the whiskey herd the absorica herd and the Jackson herd, they have almost all the bugs that we think are most important in, in causing pneumonia in bighorn sheep. Well, so over the years, there has been a lot of work um, focused on, on the Whiskey Mountain herd unit in particular. And as I've alluded to, the Whiskey Mountain Technical Committee um, began in 1968 with a with a memorandum of agreement between the Forest Service BLM and the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. Um, that tech committee back then wrote a comprehensive bighorn sheep management plan that still has a lot of, of um, valuable information and, and actions to consider in it. And we did so in 2018 when most recently the department in, in partnership with the Wyoming Wild Sheep Foundation's chapter, National Wild Sheep Foundation, and the Ruckels House Institute at the University of Wyoming went through an extensive public process, a collaborative process in 2018. And in a nutshell, we literally spent a year with many of you giving us your time um, considering what, what we need to be thinking about with this herd. What are the primary issues that are affecting this herd? Um, and, then, and then how do we best resolve them? What are some of the tools in our toolbox that we need to be thinking about to try to revert or at least arrest this population's decline? And hopefully at some point in the future, um, see some recovery in bighorn sheep in this herd. And so, this Whiskey Mountain Bighorn Sheep Plan in 2019 is what's primarily guiding our, our focus and management efforts um, right now. But as you can see that last bullet statement, I hated to put it there, but we still don't have any solutions to population decline. Certainly the work that University of Wyoming is doing that Rachel and Brittany have been working so hard to do is certainly illuminating and and helping us better understand um, some of the challenges that we have in this herd unit and we'll be hearing from them here shortly so what has some of the things that we have accomplished we are the plan is it it's not a it's not a document sitting on the shelf collecting dust that's not going to happen um, a lot of things have gotten done this past year despite many of the challenges we've all faced with with everything that's gone on but some of the things that have gotten done, and Amy and, and Joe Flower are going to talk about some of this a little bit, so I'm, not, I'm going to breeze through some of this, but we conducted a weed, a weed inventory on, on sheep winter range. We coordinated with the National Bighorn Sheep Center to develop a method for public reporting of weeds on bighorn sheep winter range so that we are certain with, with, if we do habitat improvement work that we have a good understanding what kind of plan we need to put in place to control undesired plants. Um, we are actively evaluating moving clinical, clinically ill sheep um, to Sabeel for captive research, but at this point in time, um, the facility is full, so we're going to have to wait a little bit before we can, we can do that, at least with our Sabeel unit. Um, Greg has started, has put together a comprehensive summary of disease testing done in this herd unit, and that's represented on this slide. And I'm certainly not going to go through all that. I just wanted you all to see that, goodness sakes, we've been doing a lot of disease testing in this herd. And so we have a pretty good understanding, especially given what Rachel and Brittany Lind and have contributed to our understanding 
the role that that disease plays in this herd. Um, Amy's going to talk about this, but we've got plan in place and, and, and I think may happen imminently to, to renovate the Conservation Camp memo, uh, Meadow, which is just below the Glacier Trailhead. Um, and we've got some plan, and Joe's going to talk about that, doing some vegetation management um, to enhance bighorn sheep habitat on Whiskey Mountain. So what's the plan? What's the future? The plan's future? Um, we've got the Whiskey Mountain Tech Committee that's that's leading this charge. They've established assignments and a timeline to continue implementation of the strategies and action items in that plan. We are expanding Rachel and Brittany's work to the to the Pinedale portion of this herd unit, Hunt Area 8. We're calling it the West Side Story. This is going to be an opportunity for us perhaps to understand how a segment of this herd can continue to do well in spite of being exposed likely to the same pathogens that are causing pneumonia on our side of the mountain may help us understand how they're doing it and perhaps lend us some ideas how to how to change it on our side. So those sheep are literally going to be for the first time in history I'm um, going to be radio collared again by the Monteith shop and that's going to happen literally if it's not I don't think it's happening as we speak, but it's going to in the next few days. Those, they're actually capturing those sheep at about 11,000 feet. So a pretty neat, pretty phenomenal um, effort. Forest Service really came through with, with the dispensation to allow helicopter capture inside the wilderness area, which is, which is very much appreciated. Um, and again, the lamb survival study that Rachel and Brittany are doing is gonna help us um, guide management actions that are indicated in that plan into the future. We all recognize we needed to wait and get the results that, of that study before we moved on with many things. We're going to continue collaborating with the public just as we're doing tonight. Um, and, and we are evaluating targeting removal of clinically ill sheep. There's quite a bit of work going on in the West with this, with this idea. So um, stay tuned. I think we'll be hearing a little bit more about this perhaps in the next few months. Um, one thing that was identified in the plan is, is attempting to remove any wandering mountain goats in this herd unit and we've worked on that the last two years. We've not had the opportunity to remove the one goat that we know is here just because we haven't been lucky enough to find him but we've got a chapter 56 that allows us to take that goat um, when the opportunity arises. And then we're also continuing to monitor wolf activity with radio collared animals and, and mapping their distribution in relation to bighorn sheep distribution to see how they um, interact. That's all I've got for you tonight. I hope, I hope I've provided Sarah what you hope, but I certainly am here to answer any questions or try to. Thank you, Daryl. That was an excellent update. We do have one question um, from Kathy Trainer. She asks, does the Pinedale herd have the same DNA as the whiskey herd? They also have the big three infections like whiskey. Yeah, so that's a good question. And again, um, we have not had our hands on these sheep, so they will be disease tested. They'll go through what Hank Edwards refers to as the full meal deal. So we will get a picture of the pathogens that they that they harbor, so we don't we don't know what they've got yet, and at the same time we'll also be collecting you know blood samples, so we'll have some genetic material that that the geneticists at UW I'm sure will be very interested in Kathy to answer your questions. Um, at this time we don't know. Can you hear us uh, when we talk? Hi, hi, Lainey, I hear you. Okay. Well, my question is, you know, if, if the West side is doing so much better, is there, you know, you say we have quality or, or a lot of, you know, good forage, but is the quality uh, the same as the Pine, Pinedale side? Yeah, and that's a great question, Lainey, and something certainly that, that Rachel and Brittany are going to talk about in a few minutes because they are comparing what they're seeing in terms of forage quality on summer ranges between the Jackson and the whiskey herd. 
and that will continue with the Dubois side and the Pinedale side. So we're going to know in the next few years. Any other questions? I saw, I came by Red Rocks today. There were nine ewes down there on the corner and I stopped and watched them for a while. Three of them had collars on and one of the collars had a big orange patch on it. But I, so are you collaring the Arrow Mountain sheep too? Yeah, Laney, that collaring effort, and, and I don't want to steal Rachel and Brittany's thunder, but they're just in a recording, so they're not going to care tonight. <laughs> um, but yes, that with that, the, the Arrow Mountain sheep, we've collared both sheep in areas 9 and 10 as part of this study, and we and obviously the Red Rock sheep as well, yeah. as, you, as you saw. There, there were no lambs with the ewes today. That's correct, none of the lambs, and I'll, let's hold on to that. I'll let Rachel and Brittany talk about that, yeah. <laughs> Great segue um, to the, Daryl, if you wouldn't mind, could you please give me host access? Yes, um, I will do that. All right. Good thing we did this earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Training. Organizational capacity in. <laughs> Good habit, Sarah. <laughs> example. Um, the, next, um, the next piece of the agenda we move to now is the Monteith study update, as Daryl mentioned, um, Brittany Wagler and Rachel Smiley are two graduate studies who are heavily involved in Dr. Kevin Monteith's study out of the University of Wyoming. Um, that study began three years back. Um, they, I will be sharing an update from them. Today they are in Cody, actually out on sheep capture as we speak. Um, so they were sad they could not make it today, but they grace, graciously sent us a video um, to give us their update. Please bear with me as I share my screen. take us there. Joel, that's Brittany. We're the graduate students running the bighorn sheep lamb survival here in Wyoming. And just in case you're not already familiar with the project, uh, we're studying three different herds of sheep in Wyoming. So the Whiskey Mountain herd there in Dubois, the Jackson herd, and the Absorca herd. And there's some interesting differences between the herds and especially their response to pneumonia or the pathogens that cause pneumonia. So the goal of our project is kind of to dig deeper into these differences. And the way we're doing this is, um, on, is a longitudinal monitoring project. So every December and March, we catch adult sheep, adult females in those three herds and collect data on pathogen presence, immune function, nutritional condition, and the reproductive status. And then kind of where Brittany and I come in especially is we're also collaring lambs just in the Whiskey Mountain and Jackson herd um, to get at lamb survival, what's going on with the lambs in these two herds. Um, kind of trying to connect the moms and their environment to how well they're able to raise lambs. I'm just gonna pause for a moment. Can I ask that everyone please mute, if you, please mute at the moment. In the Jackson herd, um, human fish surveys kind of show us that lamb survival is doing well there, while obviously in the whiskey herd, it's not doing so great. Um, so we wanna piece out why that's happening. So this year in 2020, it was kind of a rocky start because of COVID. We, um, originally, we're told our field season had to be canceled. Um, they didn't want researchers going out into the field, but um, with some persuasion and some help from other folks like you guys, we were able to continue on with, um, with some restrictions. So it was mostly our crew within the Monteith shop. Some of the other grad students actually took their summers off of working on their own projects and helped us out. So we were really grateful for that. And we were able to catch 20 lambs total this summer, nine in the Jackson herd and 11 in the whiskey herd. Now breaking the whiskey herd up into the sub herds, we caught three on the Tory rim side of things and then eight in the Red Creek portion of the herd. And so those Tory rim lambs are the Tory rim females are the ones who go up to the middle mountain and mile long lake area and then the red creek 
emails go all the way back to the Downs Lake area. And so this is the overall summary of what happened with all of 20 of these lambs we caught. Um, we're excited. We do still have four lambs alive. Those are all in the Jackson herd now. Um, we caught a few of them in our December captures and got data on how much they weigh, disease status, things like that. And um, just an interesting little tidbit, the lambs that we caught weighed like around 90 to 100 pounds, which is pretty cool that they grew so fast from, we catch them around 10 pounds when they're neonates and gain 80 pounds over the summer. Um, that unknown column is pretty big this year. That's just collars kind of disappear and we don't know what happened to them. We can't get any points from the GPS collars and we can't find them using telemetry. So um, unsure what happened with those ones. Um, there's a couple of them in the Jackson herd that we're not positive have died, but um, just don't have any information on those. And then um, that predation bar is kind of high this year, which we'll talk about more later. And so just comparing things to what Comparing to what happened last year, um, last year we did have a lot of pneumonia deaths and this year we have a few more predation, um, but that might be a little messy whether it's attributed to pneumonia or predation. Um, a couple of abandonments, pneumonia again, of course, and accidents, trauma happens too. Yeah, so if we break up all of those mortalities by cause and look at those throughout throughout time, um, we're finding um, a few interesting things. So it appears that the lambs are most vulnerable early on in their life. Um, that's when we see the most predation and accidents and abandonments. Um, however, later on in the summer and into the fall, that's when we start seeing the pneumonia deaths. And that the first year was by far the biggest cause of death later in life. Um, most of those have been in the whiskey herd. However, in October, we had one lamb die of pneumonia in the Jackson herd. And that seemed to be an isolated case. Um, and throughout, there was only one lamb from the Dubois herd that made it uh, into the winter. And Bill Sinkovich was able to photograph that lamb um, down on winter range. And he saw some pretty bad signs of pneumonia, as you can see uh, by this lamb. Uh, he had a stuffy nose uh, and appeared to be coughing, but was able to live all the way until February, when I think on early February, we got a mortality alert. And we had actually been watching this lamb for a while because on in late January, he separated from mom and Greg Anderson went out to kind of just take a look and see why he wasn't with mom anymore. And um, we noticed, or Greg noticed that he had a pretty bad limp in his front leg. Um, and yeah, was nearby other sheep, but not really a part of that group for some reason. And sure enough, like about a week later he died and it was a mountain lion predation. Um, we were able to get the head and bring the head to the vet lab. And by looking at the trachea, uh, the pathologist was able to identify that even though Greg didn't see as bad of signs of pneumonia as Bill saw earlier in the summer, this lamb still had underlying pneumonia and probably predisposed it to, to dying of predation. Um, so yeah, it's kind of tricky when we're piecing together the lamb survival data. Um, even though we didn't see as many pneumonia deaths this year, it does seem like some of the, under, the underlying cause of some of the predations were actually caused by pneumonia. So yeah, in, to further try to understand the differences between the Dubois and the Jackson herds and why the Dubois population is not doing so well, um, we're continuing with our vegetation surveys um, we go out to GPS points of all the sheep and we do line point intercept transects and we are collecting forage samples and picking up fecal as well so we can piece together diet information. Um, 
Um, also, some things we have been working on this winter. Um, we sent in a serum from the lab from the lambs to look at passive immunity. And so we can try to see if mothers are providing any um, resistance to pneumonia to their lambs and whether or not the mothers in Jackson are doing a better job of this than the mothers in Dubois. And additionally, we sent in a bunch of our plant clippings to, um, to a lab so they can look at digestible energy and crude protein and trace minerals such as selenium so we can see the habitat quality and see if there's any differences um, in forage quality between the Jackson and Dubois herds and see if that's affecting these sheep's ability to tolerate pneumonia. Um, and other questions that we are digging into going forward, um, I already talked about the habitat quality. Um, we've been working on addressing whether or not there's energetic energetic costs of just carrying these pathogens. So a lot of times we see sheep in Dubois that aren't necessarily diseased. They look perfectly healthy, but they're carrying these pathogens that are related to, that could give them to pneumonia. So we're investigating whether or not there's any sort of energetic cost of carrying those pathogens. Um, and as again, we're looking at if mothers are transferring antibodies to to their offspring and additionally in March we are going to be capturing a portion of the whiskey herd that is high elevation residents um, so they share the same summer range as the portion of the whiskey herd that we've been looking at however they stay up high all winter whereas the whiskey sheep come rest of the whiskey sheep come back down low um, so we are going to be investigating whether or not that has any influence on their susceptibility to disease. And yeah, with that, we'd like to thank all of our funders and collaborators and partners. This work would not be possible without all of you. And yeah, I guess hopefully Daryl does a good job answering all of your questions. And feel free to reach out to Rachel or I. Um, we'll give our email addresses to Sarah and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, Brittany, even though they're not here with us now. Um, we have one question from Amira Bakir. Um, she asks, has the research team considered adding pneumonia vaccination to the sheep capture program? Can, can someone speak to the potential feasibility as well as wildlife implications of vaccinating a wild herd? Sarah, this is Daryl. I'll take a shot of that. And I just want to start by saying that it's really neat that you've got such a diverse of folks that are involved in this because it's this kind of kind of thinking, different ideas and thinking out of the box that are good for all of us. Mm -hmm. Amir, I think I think the answer to your question is it's going to be fairly difficult with pneumonia and bighorn sheep because while we think we know which pathogens are most likely to be responsible for the clinical pneumonia that we're observing in the field, we're not certain what they are. And so, you know, one thing that we probably learned from this past year is how difficult vaccinations really are to, to develop and, 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 and to develop them so that they're effective. And so there, there isn't only just a bunch of different species of bacteria, but there's different um help me kevin what's the word i'm looking for there's different variants of those bacteria that 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 we're not certain again which ones are are most responsible for pneumonia so we don't have we don't have a vaccination for it and, and even if we did i think the logistics and the 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 the, the how effective we could be at administering a vaccine may limit um, how valuable it could be at, at a herd unit level. But it's a good thought. Daryl, if I, if I can, uh, let me try to help add to your answer. And for those of you who I have not met, I'm Kevin Hurley. I work for the Wild Sheep Foundation National after 30 good years in Wyoming. And uh, five years ago, moved to Bozeman when our headquarters relocated. And actually now I'm living in Southwest Idaho. Um, so I've been around this game 40 plus years, but one of the things that Daryl's correct in saying, um, and I'll just give you a simple 
my simple-minded version because I'm, I'm not a microbiologist. But to me, there's a, there's a suite of pathogens. You saw Daryl's pie charts or Hank Edwards' pie charts that show all the different pathogens. One of the things that I believe is that MOV or mycoplasma tends to be a setup artist. If that gets into the trachea, that what happens, and this is work that Tom Besser at Washington State University and others have demonstrated, is it paralyzes the cilia in the windpipe. So just imagine if you had a cold or, you know, and you wanted to cough up or hack up something and get rid of it. You have all these little hairs, these cilia in your windpipe that are beating. Well, what MOV does is it compromises those cilia and basically paralyzes them. So there's not that upward motion and there's no way to expel fluid from the lungs. And so if there's an infection, white blood cells, whatever fluids, they just descend into the lower lobes of the lung. And there's no way that they can cough and get rid of them. And that's why you see videos or you, you witness sheep in the wild just <coughs> racked with coughing, trying to get that stuff up and out and they can't. And so aside from MOV being somewhat of a setup artist, then there are other bacterial pathogens that come in and sort of deliver the whammy. Um, there's been work that said, you know, massive doses of MOV won't necessarily kill a bighorn without some of these other subsequent pathogens coming in on top of that. Um, I don't want to go down the, the Manheimia versus MOV deal, but bottom line is, um, again, not being a microbiologist, but my understanding is that mycoplasma over pneumonia lacks a cell wall, and that's one of the precursors to have an effective vaccine is there has to be a cell wall to that bacteria. And, and, and I'm not sure of all the details, but there have been no uh, successes developing a vaccine for MOV bacteria. And so right there, aside from the logistics of getting it to them, it's ineffective. And so that kind of ties both hands behind your back. So did I confuse everybody or happy to answer any question if I can help Daryl? Thank you. We have one more question here from Jennifer Hazeldine. Um, she says, selenium de de deficiency can also have secondary deficiencies of iodine. This double punch can impact respiratory function as well as the immune system. If it were possible to somehow improve quality of forage, does anyone believe that would help the herd survive pneumonia, increase immune function, increase survival rate? I think the short answer to that question, Sarah, is we hope so. And certainly that's part of our, you know, part of our intent with doing the habitat work that Amy and Joe are gonna talk about. But certainly we are equally um, interested in anything that we can do um, to improve immune function. And truthfully, the only thing that we're likely gonna have any opportunity is, is try to affect the vegetation and the quality of the vegetation that they have available to them. So let's hope so. Let's hope so. Thank, thank you, Daryl. And that's an excellent segue to the next area of our agenda, which is a bighorn habitat update. So with that, I will give the show over to Joe Flower, who is a wildlife biologist with the US Forest Service. Joe, I will give you host access so you can share your screen. All right. There, if you don't mind, so after my talk and after listening to Rachel and Brittany, it's, it's kind of gall dang it. You know, it's, we're looking down the barrel of a lot of, a lot of population decline. And I just want, the, the one thing I wanted to say and I failed to is that, so lamb counts, the lamb ratios that Gray counted this year are actually up quite a bit. And so we are in, in an improving trend since 2017. So there is a little bit of a, a glimmer of hope there. At least we're seeing more lambs this year than we have in the previous three years. Good update, thank you. Kat, I see Kathy Trainer, board president, fingers crossed. <laughs> we'll train her on that. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you, Kevin. Joe, the show is yours. All right, let me see if I can get set up here, folks. One sec. OK, 
Okay, are you guys seeing a slide deck here that says Tory Rim prescribed fire? Yep. Yep. Okay. Let me get this started and then I'll kind of introduce myself here. All right. Well, thank you for the invite, you guys. My name is Joe Flower. I'm the wild, South Zone Wildlife Biologist on the Shoshone Forest here. I've been in place since about 2018. And uh, I am the Forest Service Rep on the Bighorn Sheep Tech Committee. Um, and kind of honored to be here tonight and wanted to share just a quick overview and update on a habitat project we've been kind of working on for the last several years, uh, the Tory Rim Prescribed Fire. Um, so just a little bit of background here. This project has kind of been originated, I think, quite a while back with the Big Corn Sheep Tech Committee. Um, but really in 2019, that collaborative process that Daryl mentioned really kind of brought this back to life. And we've been pushing on it pretty hard ever since. So um, tonight I wanted to give just a quick bit of background on the project, give you an overview uh, of what we're trying to do here, and then outline some next steps and sort of a timeline for planning and implementation for this project. And uh, thanks to Amy for these awesome photographs. I totally stole them. <laughs> so quick ori area orientation. I think many of you are very familiar with this ground, but where we're talking about here is that uh, Torrey Rim Whiskey Mountain kind of complex on the east side of the divide here. It's uh, kind of a, a little bit of a complex jurisdictional landscape with the uh, Shoshone having a good chunk of it and the uh, Whiskey Basin uh, Wildlife Habitat Management kind of containing most of those lower elevation winter ranges. Um, uniquely, the, the project area that we're kind of trying to work in here is the glacier edition of the Fitzpatrick Wilderness. And this is a kind of an interesting, unique wilderness area that was established in 1984 under the Wyoming Wilderness Act. It came with some interesting enabling legislation that provides some flexibility to continue motorized access for bighorn sheep management in there. Um, and that this whole area, as you know, is a crucial winter range and seasonal tra uh, transition habitat for the Whiskey Mountain herd. So I don't need to belabor any of this because you guys are all up to speed now with the herd update, but we're talking about whiskey sheep. Um, I'll skip through most of this, but one thing I did want to mention was one thing that we kind of constantly come back to as part of this project is just the recognition that, as Daryl mentioned earlier, not only are the, this, these sheep um, just a fundamental part of the identity of the community of Dubois, they're also an icon of the Fitzpatrick wilderness itself. And so we're trying to kind of tier to that rationale to push uh, forward this project in wilderness. Um, and as you kind of caught from Daryl's talk earlier, uh, this 2019 collaborative process did result in a new management plan that called out some of the, the underpinnings for the need for this kind of work. So one of the things that that collaborative process really sort of brought back to the front was just a, a real change in habitat conditions that we've seen, uh, particularly on these kind of this Wind River front. Um, this is a picture of Whiskey Mountain, or I'm sorry, Windy Mountain right around the turn of the century. I think it was taken right around 1903, 1904. Um, and, you know, what you see up there is old burn scars, kind of patchy conifer coverage, probably a lot of grass forb cover. And when you contrast that with what we have up there today, um, there's a lot more conifer up there. Um, and really there's little debate that we've done a great job over the last several decades of putting out fires pretty aggressively on this landscape. And because of that, we've had a lot of just ecological succession change in vegetation communities here, a lot more conifer coverage. And so that change in sort of habitat has, the thinking is that that may have some effect on bighorn sheep seasonal movements between summer and winter range, um, perhaps causing some limiting factor for access to some areas of suitable winter range. And then just kind of a general decrease in bighorn sheep habitat quality compared to 
the more historical conditions in this area. And again, this is whiskey, this is a windy mountain complex, but we expect kind of similar, a similar setup over on uh, whiskey as well. And this isn't a new concept, right? This was called out in the, the early management plan that the, the tech committee works under. In that management plan, it was pointed out early on that open areas of Whiskey Mountain are, are being encroached by conifers. And if, if these areas are not maintained, they'll revert to timbered stands. And if that's allowed to happen, there will be a, a risk of reducing and eventually preventing essential bighorn sheep migration. And this is kind of interesting that the tech committee recognized really in the late 70s that judicious, properly planned, well-managed use of prescribed fire for habitat and migration corridor management holds the greatest potential for addressing this problem. And this is also called out in our newest management plan uh, where we, we pointed out that many factors have contributed loss and fragmentation of bighorn sheep habitats in the Whiskey Mountain herd. And a primary concern is the ecological succession in this area where, you know, you have the pro just a natural process of conifers colonizing areas that were once maybe more open, maybe more grass forb dominated. And that conifer kind of encroachment has, has dramatically altered many areas that were once open and, and dominated by grass forb. And that has con probably has consequences for this herd. And so in response to this understanding, the, the Whiskey Mountain Tech Committee has been working for some time to actually implement prescribed burns. And I want to just run through a quick sort of synopsis of what's already been done up there as far as recent burns go. And so the two most recent burns up in this part of the country have been the, I'm going to call them the Tory 1 and the Tory 2 burns. And the polygons you see here, guys, are that's the, this is not the entire extent of the burns, but it's just two areas I wanted to call out. So the Tory 1 burn is this bigger polygon, primarily in the, the Glacier Edition of the Fitzpatrick Wilderness. Um, this was done in 2004 as just a broadcast burn. Um, critically, there was no mechanical pretreatment for this burn. So we just went in there and basically put fire on the ground and let it do its thing. And what we found in there was pretty limited success because of really insufficient ground fuels, low burn intensities and limited success where we didn't get a lot of conifer mortality, um, kind of failure to open up these, these migration corridors between the lower elevation Torrey Rim country and then the higher summer range country, transitional country up by Whiskey Mountain and beyond. And that's co really contrasted to what we found in, in uh, the Torrey Two burn, which was done in 2005. And that's that smaller polygon there on the the, the whiskey uh, basin WHMA. And this burn was a lot more successful. What, what happened on this one was there was selective chainsaw felling prior to the burn where con, uh, chainsaw crews went through there, selectively felled conifers, and then after those trees cured out, we, we sent fire through there. And what that did was really elevated the burn intensities and got fire, uh, to basically to propagate vertically in these stands and kind of get a crown fire through there where we get higher uh, extent of conifer mortality and really opened up that habitat. And so that a much more successful setup for bighorn sheep. And this just shows kind of a zoomed in view where I'm talking about the 2005 Tory 2 is that little polygon on the right and the larger Tory 1 burns from 2004 there. And so just kind of showing an, another map here. This is kind of interesting. These are uh, bighorn sheep location data from 2015, 2016. And what you can see in here is um, really limited use of these heavily, uh, heavily forested slopes in the glacier edition. Um, and and so contrasting that with, you know, some pretty good consistent use in the, the Tory 2, 2 burn scar. And this is sort of validated too, just from general observations. Um, maybe many of you have seen that we've seen pretty good sheep use in that Tory 2 burn where um, sheep kind of go in there, there's standing snags, um, there's kind of wind sheltered loafing habitat in there. And in contrast, they're really avoiding these heavily timbered slopes in the glacier edition. 
And so really the current condition we're dealing with on many of these kind of this eastern flank of whiskey is, you know, this current condition here, which is this is actually a picture in the Torrey One burn scar where we have dense trees, really high canopy cover. There's limited sight distances for sheep. You know, they're tending to avoid these areas probably due to increased predation risk. And there's limited grass forb production in there. And really what the goal of this project is, is we're wanting to use some selective felling and prescribed fire to move toward these desired conditions. And this is a picture from that Tory 2 burn scar where we've got you know, a lot of snags, there's low canopy cover, really good sight distance of distances for sheep, and a really nice grass forb community in there that's kind of this uh, enhanced forage area that can be used as sort of sheltered loafing habitat. And so what we're trying to do here is basically duplicate the good outcomes we got in this Tory 2 burn, but kind of go to a larger scale on this east flank of Whiskey Mountain. And so that kind of brings me just kind of a, a quick overview of the, this, this project we've been in the planning phase of for a while. This is that eastern flank of whiskey. What we're trying to queue up in here is a broadcast burn on this eastern flank that would enhance bighorn sheep habitat. And the anticipated effects in here we're trying to get after are really trying to open up seasonal migration corridors between this winter range on Torrey and summer ranges up on Whiskey and beyond. Um, we're trying to enhance grass forb communities through there with the use of fire and to create these wind shelter loafing habitats near Torrey Rim. Um, and so the design, the burn is being designed to sort of link the existing burn scars on this eastern flank and uh, open up this, this habitat. And really the linchpin of this project is our ability to selectively fell conifers within the wilderness prior to the burn. So what we're trying to do in there is get approval and permission to go in there pre-burn, uh, selectively fell conifers in the glacier edition, uh, basically establish like a one foot deep fuel bed that we would allow to cure out for a, a season or two, and then follow that up with prescribed burning to elevate burn intensities to get um, fire to propagate vertically through these canopies and open up this habitat. And the other thing that the, the reason that selective felling is so important is because getting that fuel bed in place will really allow us to burn under more moderate environmental uh, conditions, uh, basically enabling us to get good outcomes during a spring or a fall burn rather than trying to burn in heavy timber in the summer, which is in, imparts a lot of risk to control fire in, these, in this area. And so um, the last thing I'll say here, just kind of broad brush uh, overview of the project is, as Daryl mentioned, really the, although the primary sort of target for this project is these, this kind of country in the glacier edition, this project will involve and sort of um, has to have a, a prerequisite for burning on the Whiskey Basin WHMA prior to igniting in the wilderness. And so we're actively coordinating right now with uh, Game and Fish on, on project design and um, getting this routed for approval. And so just a quick snapshot of what our timeline is here. As, as Daryl mentioned and Amy can outline, is last summer we, we kicked off field surveys in this area where we've done invasive species surveys uh, on winter range. We've been uh, kind of tweaking the project design, getting this thing boxed in with our fire and fuel staff. And where we're going right now is that we are seeking, um, seeking approval from the Chief of the Forest Service to use fire and uh, felling within the glacier edition. And that requires wilderness analysis and uh, a fairly intensive process to, to get permission to basically uh, have prohibited acts going on in wilderness, which basically are mechanical, mechanical use. The other thing we're doing this winter and spring are running this uh, back to the front of the Whiskey Mountain Tech Committee for review, just to make sure we have a, a really kind of uh, collaboratively developed project. 
And this summer, we anticipate elevating this project through our first phase of our NEPA process, which is uh, public scoping. Uh, so that'll be a really good opportunity. This We'll be looking for public comment on this project this summer as we're seeking uh, approval for this project from the chief. And then the next steps here, these are all sort of contingent um, on getting that approval process, but we're hoping that best case scenario is we can move through our, our NEPA analysis this winter and get a, a decision in place in the spring. And that would allow us to do our first phase of implementation next summer. That's the that felling operations where we go in there, have contract saw crews move through some of this country and drop, establish that one foot deep fuel bed, and then let that cure out for a season or two and follow it up with actual burning in either 23 or 24. So that was a, a quick and dirty sort of update on the Tory Rim prescribed fire, but uh, this is definitely a collaborative effort. Really appreciate the support we've gotten from our interagency Whiskey Mountain Bighorn Sheep Tech Committee, as well as the Wild Sheep Foundation who has helped fund some of the, the pre-treatment surveys and uh, appreciate the opportunity to bring this to the to the fore for the Bighorn Sheep Center's annual meeting. So I, uh, I might have a few minutes for questions and I'm happy to take those. Thanks guys. Joe? Yes. This is Mark. Hi Mark. Hey, uh, I wanted to clarify something you said. Um, the uh, Tech Committee in 1984, when the Wyoming Wilderness Act added the Glacier Edition, they went to Malcolm Wallop and Al Simpson and requested that those individuals add the language to the Glacier Edition to allow for mechanical treatment and uh, motorized stuff for habitat management in the Glacier Edition. And so it's not illegal in this area. I keep telling to tell people that and we get a lot of pushback from the wilderness people however there is uh, documentation that this was allowed and so I'm glad to see that you guys are pursuing that but hopefully um, you know we got to keep that on the forefront that that this additional to the wilderness included the language that allows for exactly what you're trying to do mm -hmm. Yeah, Mark, I wish our attorneys agreed with you. The, the trouble has been multiple interpretations of that enabling legislation. And the, the language in there says basically the Glacier Edition allows for some forms of motorized access for you know, proper management of the sheep herd. The problem is, is if you look through the congressional record when they were actually debating this on the floor, the the consensus around what motorized access meant was basically allowing continued motorized access for trapping and translocation up in this area. And there's a kind of a stinger <laughs> statement in the congressional record where I can't remember who made it, but it was one of the, I believe it was one of the senators who was uh, discussing the legislation on the floor. And he said that that basically that enabling legislation did not include the ability to manipulate habitat in the Glacier Edition. And so that kind of got us and has um, basically um, caused this, this uh, process we're in now, which is basically elevating this for approval uh, from the Chief of this Forest Service because um, they are the sole person in our organization that can authorize the manipulation of habitat within wilderness. So, and Joe, Kevin Hurley here, Joe, uh, you know, Mark's exactly right. Some of us were working there in the 80s when that language was developed in the Wyoming Wilderness Act. And so, um, excuse my French, but that's horseshit that, that uh, 35 years later, people are still throwing roadblocks in. That language was quite clear, as I recall. It wasn't restricted to motorized access for trapping. It talked about habitat management, proactive yeah. habitat management for bighorn sheep. And so um, offline, I'd love to talk to you. you know, we have friends in the chief's office that we can call and we can rattle some cages. Seriously, there's no way that that should take five years from start to finish to implement something that was authorized almost 40 years ago now. 
So I'll just leave that off for Kevin. Yeah, and I think maybe one thing to go back on here, folks, is since we are entering that first phase of NEPA this summer, your feedback is going to be really important and timely to capture in the first phase of this process. And um, yeah, we'll be looking for that feedback. So I appreciate that. Hey, Joe, while you, uh, you're on, can I ask you a question unrelated to the habitat stuff? Do you know if, if the Pinedale Ranger District is monitoring the air quality station that they have out of Elkhart Park? And do you know if anybody in the Lander District, if she's shown for us, is monitoring the air quality station uh, behind the rock shop, or that used to be behind the rock shop on South Pass? Yeah. Mark, I, I don't have any information on that Pinedale side since that's out of our my jurisdiction. And I think, unfortunately, that I think it's a NADP site you're talking about, National Air Deposition Monitoring uh, down there on South Pass. I think that one was under a cooperative agreement with BLM, that, and I do not believe uh, that one is currently being funded. So I think we may have lost our uh, long-term NADP site on South Pass recently. I can follow up with uh, our hydrologist out of Lander who uh, coordinates the data collection on that and I can, I can uh, get a, a more clear answer for you. But I think, I think we have lost that one. You know, well, can you find out when was, you know, it was run from mid 80s through uh, the 90s by Liz Oswald probably even into, into 2000. I was just curious if we have that data for, um, you know, the length of time that we did have it for. I think there is a long-term da uh, data set in there, Mark. Okay. Um, and again, that's the South Zone Hydrologist. So I'm happy to follow up with you offline. If you want to flip me an email, I can get you a more detailed okay. uh, answer on that. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, we do have two questions. Um, if, in the interest of time, if you don't mind, Kathy and Julia, um, we can follow up those via email. Um, and next, I would ask Joe if you could please give Amy Anderson host access um, so she can walk us through our second part of the Bighorn Habitat update. I just like, before Amy kicks it off, I'd just like to pause a second. And it's when we come together at these types of forums, it becomes a lot clearer to see the numerous parties required in a lot of this decision making and path forward. Um, so I truly appreciate um, all of our guest speakers who have come on today to show that um, to the public to demonstrate the collaboration and the partnership that occurs here. Thank you. Um, Amy, do we? Hi. Hi. Okay. <laughs> Looks like you're host at, you have host access now. So um, okay. we'll see if I can do this. Um, I should have been on here and had a lesson with Daryl. Uh, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. What does that mean? Let's see. Yeah, I, it's not going to let me share my screen, so I might just have to give an update here. Um, so uh, what Daryl talked about was that, and Joe also, Joe, you did a, a really good job with that presentation. Uh, thank you for, for that. that. That was awesome information about everything that's gone into that prescribed burn. Um, and one of the questions that I sort of saw partially was what we had done or what we plan to do with invasive species. And I can talk a little bit about that um, moving forward here. Nope, it's not gonna let me, okay. So the first thing I wanted to talk about, so through that Whiskey Bighorn Sheep Management Plan that came out of that public co collaboration that we all went through together a few years ago, um, was a plan to renovate the, the Trail Lake Meadow. And that is something that we've tried to do for for years and, and um, it just hasn't happened. And so we are moving forward with that. Um, we're partnering with the Forest Service to burn that meadow this winter. It should happen um, imminently, hopefully, uh, if we get the right burn window, uh, we should be able to move forward 
with that prescribed burn. Um, and the Shoshone Forest folks will be conducting that burn uh, to clear off the forage that's there, which is not very palatable to bighorn sheep. It's a lot of uh, old coarse smooth brome and basin wild rye, and the sheep just don't use that meadow uh, like they used to. So we're gonna burn that off uh, and probably follow that up with a springtime herbicide treatment to um, Smooth brome is notoriously very difficult to control um, without the use of herbicide. And so we will probably use a herbicide to try to get a handle on the smooth brome. And we'll kind of watch it and see if it continues to come back. And if it does, there will be another herbicide treatment in the fall of 2021. And then uh, we worked to put together a seed mix that we think will offer a lot better forage options for sheep and also uh, wintering mule deer in that valley. So um, we'll probably include some legumes in that seed mix as well as um, several high stature grasses for the sheep to access when there's snow cover and then some lower stature grasses as well that um, we found that they uh, prefer uh, through fecal samples that we've taken of the sheep over the years. So um, that seeding should take place in probably March or April of 2022. And that meadow is irrigated. So um, that summer we should really start to see a good stand of forage um, to replace the smooth brome that's there now. And uh, that, that meadow is only about 35 acres. And so the, when that burn happens, um, it's a relatively low complexity burn. And um, we'll probably close off the road there for a bit just to make sure that we have all the access we need. Um, and yeah, hopefully that'll be happening soon. Uh, you, are you guys getting snow now? <laughs> Cause that'll further <laughs> slow things down but once things dry out a little bit we should be able to uh, burn that meadow. Um, one of the other things that came up and Daryl mentioned it briefly was um, the Dubois Invasive Species Watch program that Shelby and I uh, presented to you last year at this meeting. Um, it's uh, an app on that you can put on your smartphone called iNaturalist. And we created a program through iNaturalist to, um, for people to identify and report to us uh, invasive species outbreaks within the Dubois area. And that's Whiskey, the East Fork, you know, anywhere around town and especially within these bighorn sheep areas. And we did a virtual training, Shelby and I and Karen put on a virtual training last year about this time. And um, we got a few observations through the summer, but I think it just kind of fell off of people's radar with, um, you know, COVID and the craziest craziness of this past year. So um, we really want to reinvigorate that that project and see if we can get people who are out hiking to help us identify outbreaks of invasive species. And <laughs> the ones that we're looking for, obviously cheatgrass, that's a, that's a biggie. Um, it's not hugely prominent in the Dubois country and we want to keep it that way. So uh, we really want people to identify patches of cheatgrass and let us know where that is. Um, but also things like white top, um, which is fairly common along the East Fork, uh, Canada thistle, musk thistle, uh, the different um, nap weeds. And um, we also ask people to just observe things that they weren't sure what it is, um, just so that we, um, yeah, if, we, if there's new things out there, we wanna know about those as well. Um, and by getting those observations, I, I get alerts of, of those observations as soon as they happen. Uh, so if necessary, we can um, plan to treat those as soon as we get uh, those observations on our, on our radar. Um, so what Karen and I talked about is potentially having an in-person training 
uh, to try to show people how to use that app. I think there was some confusion on how to, uh, how to log those observations. And so Karen and I, um, in the absence of Shelby, uh, her and I will stumble through the technical part of um, iNaturalist and hold a, um, a training. We'd like to do that in May, uh, potentially May 15th, uh, if there's no, um, <laughs> if nothing else comes up. Uh, but May 15th, we'll meet at the Sheep Center at 9 a.m. And I'll send out more information about this uh, coming up. Uh, but we'll meet at the Sheep Center and then we'll go from there to some place, potentially a, a local ranch or somewhere out on the East Fork and actually log some observations so people can practice using iNaturalist and get more comfortable with it. Ask any questions they have and um, yeah, uh, hopefully we can get people using this citizen science to really um, help with invasive species in the Dubois area. Uh, so that, uh, that'll be happening hopefully May 15th, put it on your calendar. <laughs> and uh, um, we also are partnering with the Dubois Boys and Girls Club to um, work on this uh, Dubois Invasive Species Watch as well. So um, it, it has the potential to do some good things if we can get people using it more regularly and um, it's a good way for people to be involved. So another thing that uh, that Daryl mentioned was um, the cheatgrass survey that we did last June. So um, several folks from the Dubois community and 34 other volunteers, we all met up on Tory Rim and we walked 89 miles worth of transects that day uh, looking for invasive species on Tory Rim. Um, to try to make sure that we did not have any active cheatgrass patches on that piece of winter range ahead of any prescribed burning that may happen um, in the future. And we did not, we, so we located one small patch of cheatgrass and it was on the very edge of the rim as it drops down towards the conservation camp. Uh, Bob Finley went in there almost immediately and treated that patch of cheatgrass. Uh, but what that kind of um, highlighted for us was the fact that there is a, a significant amount of cheatgrass um, on that slope that leads down from Tory Rim towards the conservation camp. And so we moved forward through the um, Game and Fish's Invasive Annual Grass Program and the um, Wyoming Natural Resource Trust. We got funding to do a cheatgrass treatment um, on that slope leading from the top of Torrey Rim down to the conservation camp. And that will be a rejuvra or indazaflam treatment. It's a newer herbicide. We're trying to use the best available science out there to control cheatgrass. It's such a problematic weed. And like I said, it's not hugely prominent in the Dubois area and we wanna keep it that way. So in June or early July, um, we will do an aerial treatment of cheatgrass on that slope. Um, in preparation for the, you know, if we do end up having the prescribed burn. And um, that treatment will be about 700 acres of invasive species of cheatgrass treatment um, on that slope. So uh, yeah, that, those are the projects that we have imminently moving forward. These are all, um, you know, through the through the tech committee and through that collaborative process projects that were identified and that we are working really hard to get accomplished so that we, you know, we get that habitat in the best com condition possible for the, for the sheep up there. Um, so if you have any questions, I guess that's, I wish I could have showed my, my pretty pictures, but I, it didn't, 
it told me I couldn't share my screen. So <laughs> um, if you have questions, let me know. Thank you, Amy. Um, I'll about the screen share. Um, we, it looks like we have one question. Kevin Hurley has his hand raised. Kevin, um, if you would unmute. Sorry, Amy. Um, Cheatgrass, are you familiar with Stuart Jennings' work? I know that he's presented to Bob Budd and the WNRT. Ryan's certainly aware of that, but you know that might be another option to look at it. It's a fertilizer treatment, not a herbicide treatment. So yep, that would be worth for sure. looking into. Um, yeah, we. Uh, I have not a lot of information about that, but um, actually Shelby, who was my technician last summer, just shared some information about it. Um, it's it's a new thing, and it'll I'll definitely keep it on my radar as we learn more about that. Um, yeah, right now we're we're uh, going with weed and pest on the the rejuvra, but as we learn more about the, I think it's called a daffix. Um, right. We'll look, we'll look at um, trying to use that too as it evolves. Yeah, and there's a fair bit of information on our WSF website and a link to Stuart's presentations. And so, um, you know, Karen and Mackenzie, that might be something that you guys want to link to from the Sheep Center. But um, Amy, I'll send you a link from our webpage so that you have direct access to that. So kudos on the iNaturalist. But as you talked about gathering mid-May, going out teaching people on some of these noxious or invasive weeds, I want to make you guys aware. And Daryl, um, you've probably heard this from Bill Jex, who's the provincial sheep and goat biologist for British Columbia. And this spring, last spring, they came out with a, kind of an iNaturalist type phone app, but it was designed and it's accessible. You can use it wherever to record wild sheep lambs and mountain goat kids. And so it's gotten a lot of use in the province and it's also rippling out beyond. British Columbia. So, Daryl, if that's anything that uh, you want to talk about offline, we can do that. But that might be something to get, you know, especially where there's chronic suppressed lambs, might be handy to get any and all observations of lambs recorded that people can, whether, like Lanny said, she saw sheep there at the Red Wall, you know, maybe get some information from the public. And it's all... Um, funneled through one website and so you can access and retrieve that information. So that exists as well. Excellent. Um, thank you, Amy. You've got Kathy's question from Kathy Trainer was what when will we be spraying Tory Rim to camp? Will these treatments block emergent growth for a long period after? Amy responded, June or July 2021 will be the treatment. Rejuvra herbicide is shown to reduce cheatgrass for up to five years. Thank you. Um, so I'll pause here. We are at 5.30. Um, if, you, uh, if you have the time, I ask you to please stay with me um, as we move into the center updates. Um, from our speakers today, um, it's testament to the community involvement, involvement of so many organizations um, and the Sheep Center's role um, in this. And so today, um, I'd like to walk you through a little bit of what's new with the Sheep Center um, and how we're doing. So I'll share my screen here to bring us to the numbers, the finances. 2020 was a remarkably difficult year for, for us. In March, we closed our doors through May. We saw a considerable operating income loss from 2019 of 15%. How do our numbers look? Grants, admissions, donations, that's a little hard, membership, gift shop, and our Bighorn Bash um, annual fundraiser are our primary income generators at the center. In 2020, our saving grace was the number of grants that we received from both foundations, as well as grants through the Wyoming Business Council. We received $76,000 in grants. Admissions um, dropped by roughly 40% in this year. 
um, but we are looking forward to a strong 2021. We saw an increase in individual donations, so thank all of you for your efforts. They're truly appreciated, um, and they allow us to keep the lights on and our exhibits going, as you can see um, back here. So a $21,000 increase in donations. Membership, a slight decrease of 3%. Thank you for your renewals. As you get calls from board members or letters from us, we appreciate your prompt response. Um, gift shop sales, we saw a hit, um, moving from $25,000 in income from $49,000 in 2019. Um, I hate to jump ahead, but we have rejuvenated our gift shop, and we'll look at some photos of that later. Come on in and visit. The Bighorn Bash is one of our um, income generators, hugest, um, and we love having you all here um, for it. In 2020, we hosted a virtual raffle in lieu of a bash in which we raised $11,430. We just want to give a round of applause for the staff. Um, in, the, in the period of management transition, they quickly stood up the virtual raffle, managed questions, and did the best they could. So thank, thank you all. So where have we been with youth and adult engagement in the times of the COVID-19 pandemic? We took this as an opportunity to stand up new and increased virtual programs. Prior to the pandemic, we did not have a YouTube channel. Staff quickly worked to create our own. Um, we have seven subscribers. Um, but through YouTube and Facebook Live, we have reached over 5,000 people. We've seen an increase in our social media impressions, reaching over 12,000. We even created an, an, a web page devoted to kids learning on our website. So if you're a teacher or a parent looking for resources, come to our website can, and there's multiple activities for you to print out and use. We were able to host Camp Bighorn this summer. It was our second year hosting the camp. Um, traditionally, it's a sleepaway camp, but this year we revised and adapted so that it would be a three-day day camp. We've had 11 youth attend, um, ages 9 through 12, with eight instructors who volunteered their time to make this all pass possible, and we thank each and every one of you. I'd just like to share a quote of a Bighorn parent who, who said, I like that the Bighorn Sheep Center took the current situation and made something happen. The changes really worked well, and it still allowed the kids to have a really fun summer experience. We're looking forward to an awesome Camp Bighorn in 2021. In addition to our educational programs, we are pleased to have launched our very own research project this January. We sampled three mineral lick sites frequented by sheep year-round in Torrey Valley. Through this study, we hope to identify changes from tests that were performed over 20 years ago to see if any changes could be contributing to the decline. Um, key items that we're testing for are selenium, lead, nitrogen, and nitrate. Just a huge thanks to Karen Sullivan, our board member Jen Hazeldean, Aaron Hanley from the Dubois Crowheart Conservation District, and Sam Schwesinger from the Dubois High School who brought the high school students um, to allow them to participate. So we launched this study in in partnership with high school students. You can see the pictures here. We brought these kids out in the field and they actually got their shovels out um, and did their own testing. And last week, um, we were able to go to the Dubois High School and perform our own lab testing. We had a soil kit, um, Aaron was there, everyone got their rubber gloves on and we were able to get various um, de degrees of information from this study. And they will be published, They'll come, they're coming out, so be on the lookout for them. To further connect with the bighorn sheep um, in our community on an intimate level, we have fortunately installed a trail cam in Whiskey Basin. In the, in the words of our very own Mackenzie Davis, um, you're able to observe wildlife from a perspective where humans aren't involved and you can see them more naturally. Um, you can visit our website where we update pictures from the trail cam um, bi-weekly, and each picture is accompanied by a fun fact. So if you wanna know all the cool things about bighorns, um, go to our website. And we just wanna give a huge thanks to Jen and Chris Hazeldean for gifting our trail cam equipment. 
it really makes these awesome pictures possible. So to take us to what's new this summer, Camp Bighorn 2021, registration is open. Um, we are keeping with the protocol that this will be a day camp, but we're moving it to four days. Um, we opened registration about a, a couple weeks ago, and we already have received $3,600 in scholarship funds. Thank you, thank you, thank you, sponsors. Um, we already have eight students who have signed up. Um, this experience mm -hmm. is going to be to leave a lifelong impression. And through our sponsors, you're helping to leave that impression. What is new this year? Um, we have field journaling where the children go out on hikes and are able to get an idea of what it's like to observe and use their journals as a tool. Um, we have ethnobotany, taxidermy, and wildlife and nature art artwork with Lainey Hicks. We're excited. Um, also, there the Mornings will be filled with more educational material. They'll be, they'll be hiking, active, but also but being um, provided with educational content. In the afternoons, we plan to have just a lot of activity, um, so kayaking and archery. If you know any children who would be interested in attending, uh, send them our way. We'd love to have them. Um, I just want to highlight that Camp Bighorn is made possible by volunteers from our local community. Uh, a few of our volunteers for 2021 are listed um, on the right here. And it's, it's Karen, it's, it's our staff here who's representing this Sheep Center, but it's these instructors who, who are volunteering their time to make it happen. Um, it's a huge testament to the support of our community of the National Bighorn Sheep Center. Um, registration forms, sponsorships forms, all can be found on our website. I'll pause here and ask, are there any questions? Okay, going on to what is new and exciting. So we are launching our first ever adult retreat program this summer at the Whiskey Mountain Conservation Camp. We understand that these are changing times. We Technology allows us to communicate with broader, diverser audiences across expanded spaces. So by way of adapting our programming and expanding what type of programs we're, we offer, we're able to connect with audience previously untapped. We bring them into our space, perhaps by writing and photography, as we are with these two retreats, and we share with them the big core narrative. And the trickle down effect, the, the multiplier is limitless. What we are introducing this year, I'm very excited to say, is a writer's retreat and a photographer's retreat. Um, in the writer's retreat, we have distinguished faculty and keynote speakers. Aaron Linzow, who you may know, is a keynote speaker. He's a motivational speaker known for his longest solo expedition in Antarctica. Apparently a very cool guy. Angus Thurmer Jr. Jr. is another keynote speaker. He's the former, former editor of Jackson Hole News and Guide, um, and he is now part of Wildfile. Faculty includes Christine Peterson. Their, their resumes are this long, so I'm not gonna read them off, I'm just picking the, the highlights. Christine Peterson, VP of Outdoor Writers Association. David Zobie, English professor um, at Casper College and fly fishing editor of Strong Magazine. Leanne Rory Powell, American poet, and she was the South Dakota po Poet Laureate from 2015 to 2019. The idea is that for the writer's retreat, mornings will be spent where attendees will be working, one, will be working with their instructor, small group sizes for individual, individualized intention. Afternoons will be filled with guest speakers from the local community, um, and evenings will be fill, filled with evenings around the campfire, um, group suggested outings to the KOA for live music and the rodeo. Prices for this are available on our website. If you have any questions, you can contact me directly at sarah at bighorn.org. Um, we, we, the whole staff, but particularly Kathy Trainer, Carolyn Gillette, um, has been working extensively and 
Cindy Jacklin, who is on the line today, on letting this um, all come together. And we're excited to watch it unfold. Thank you. To introduce our photographer's retreat, and we have our very, uh, we have our very own instructors on the call today, Bill Sincavage and Sandy Zalesko. Um, these will be our two photographer instructors for the course. We hope to have um, 12 photographer attendees who, to participate in this retreat. Bill Sincavage worked in London work has appeared in London Times, Wyoming Wildlife, and Wyoming Vacation Guide. Sandy public, has been published in Nature's Best, also Wyoming Wildlife, and Wild Planet. If you just take a, you can see in my shared screen here, photos from each of these little snippets, just phenomenal. Um, really bringing to life the beauty of this landscape, the wildlife that inhabits it, and just how lucky we are to be here, and our responsibility um, to be here. Any questions about the retreats? It's hard to see you all in this as I screen share, so. Okay, excellent. What else is new at the center? So as we evaluate um, the status quo, um, we, we identified the opportunity to give our gift shop a little bit of a remodel. Um, spearheaded by Carolyn Gillette, we changed the gift shop around um, so that we could better highlight all the really awesome things we have here. A few are featured in the photos. Um, scarves, tri trivets, really, really cool hats. I know that Mark Hinchberger wears one and sports it very well. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Um, so come on in, um, share the gift shop with anybody you know. Um, today somebody just came in and was like, this is one of the best gift shops in Dubois, and I would agree. Um, so if you have people visiting the area, send them our way. Members receive a 10% discount. Earlier today, we discussed one, my fourth key priority, which is de developing a legacy for the Sheep Center and those who are involved in this great space and great programming. Um, I'd like to give you all an update on the capital campaign that launched in 2017. The idea is to create an expanded space in the center so that we can accommodate our growing number of museum visitors and group tours. So far, we have raised $362,000 out of a $690,000 goal that was based on a bid received in 2019. Today, we record 328,000 that is remaining to be raised. But to give us some hope, to give us some light, we have just raised $4,000 since December 2020 from just four donors. People are interested and people continue to be engaged and support this project. Um, for those of you who are less familiar, this would be about a 1,900 square foot expansion on the building. Um, to give you a visual of it, it would be an extension on the west side of the building. Where are we today? We understand that with COVID-19, we've been faced with supply chain interruption, which has greatly impacted the price of material costs. Um, to see where we are, what is the possibility of continuing this project in the near future, we have identified four local contractors. Great news, because the previous contractors all um, were not local, not from Dubois, driving up prices. The, plan, the project plans are in the hands of these four contractors. They're looking at them and they will come back to us um, to give us an, an estimate. Are we still in the same, are we still in the same ballpark as we were in 2019? And if so, great, and we'll proceed. While we continue to build programming, for 2021, we envision continuing to flex, continuing to adapt, adapt to a changing world of communication, health protocols. We are hosting a series of events to flex to this. We particularly envision having increased outdoor events and expanding the subjects of our, our events to include broader categories of wildlife and outdoors education. Um, perhaps some of you attended the Outdoor Survival Chateau event 
outdoor survival shelter event with Joe Brandle. Um, tremendous success. People came out, enjoyed themselves, and became part of our Bighorn community. To give you a sneak peek of what's coming up soon, um, I have a, a short table here, but don't worry, all of this information will be found on our website. Um, what I'd like to highlight today, which is really coming up soon, um, and this you don't want to miss, it's with Bruce S. Thompson, Dubois Local, um, who will be providing an overview on winter tracking. Um, his event is titled Learning to Read Wild Signatures in the Snow. It's a two-part event, so he'll be teaching us on Zoom, and then we'll have an in-the-field activity on the sticks. We'll be going out and applying everything he's um, taught us. So if you're interested in that, you can email us, contact us to get, to get signed up. Okay. I will um, pause here, thanking all of our sponsors, the foundations and the organizations that we work with closely every day. Um, without you, it wouldn't be possible, and I'm really excited for the path forward, and thank you. I'll close today, unless there's any questions. Um, just want to invite you all, give us a phone call, walk on into our doors, send an email. We'd love to hear from you. Um, I see us, we've built a community, and let's continue to strengthen that, expand our numbers, and share the narrative of the big horns. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I will make these materials available online. The Zoom has been recorded. Um, so, if anybody, so if you guys are interested in coming back, it'll be on our website. Um, thank you all. I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Sarah. Thank you.